Let's open with a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we break the bread of life this morning, just as the food that we thank you for, we pray, will be nourishing to our bodies, we pray, Lord, that your word will be nourishing and edifying to our souls here this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. For those of you who were here last week, we were in John chapter 3, and we took a look at the witnessing approach that uh, Jesus took with Nicodemus. And I had said at the outset that I wanted to do a comparison between Nicodemus and the woman that the Lord Jesus witnesses to in John chapter 4. If you want to get in on the message that I delivered last Sunday, uh, you can check that on our website, www.thebibletabernacle.com, or it should be posted on YouTube, and you can check it out there. Well, in contrast to Nicodemus, who is a self-righteous, self-sufficient, self-satisfied, and very fastidious Pharisee, and I say fastidious because that refers to somebody who gives uh, careful attention to detail. And we looked at an example of that in our Lord's criticism of the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. We see the next witnessing occasion that Jesus has with the sultry, sin-laden life of a wanton adulterer. This woman was the complete opposite of Nicodemus. And we open in John chapter 4, where we read, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, referring to John the Baptist, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. As Jesus' notoriety grew, he was compelled to leave Judea and return to Galilee. But we read here in verse 4 that he needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. Why was that? What made that a necessity? If you view an ancient map of Israel, and in many Bibles you'll actually uh, have a map there in the back that you can uh, peruse, uh, you see that Galilee, of course, is up north, and Judea is down south, with the region of Samaria sandwiched right in between. It was customary for the Jews who were traveling from Judea north to Galilee, or vice versa, heading south to Jerusalem, to bypass Samaria entirely. They would either travel along the coastal route, the uh, Mediterranean coast, and head up north, or they would head east across the Jordan River and then travel up through Perea and the Decapolis and then cross back to the west when they reach Galilee. So we're talking about a trek probably of some 80 miles, a direct line. I was doing some measurements on that this morning. It seems if you traveled directly north from Jerusalem to Nazareth, uh, as a crow flies, a straight route, it seems like it's approximately 65 miles. So it would have been well over 70, mi 70 miles to make that trek. And that would be kind of like taking a trip from Venice here to Canyon Country, where our, our guys from the ministry come from, which is a distance of about 40 miles. But you would want to bypass the San Fernando Valley. That gives you kind of two alternatives. You either take Pacific Coast Highway uh, up towards Ventura. You could either cut across uh, Malibu Canyon Road, I guess, and then pick up the 118 or um, uh, maybe head up into Ventura, travel across the 126, or you would head east from here and pick up Interstate 5 and then go north. So go going through Samaria was a direct route to Galilee. So why is it that the Jews would actually go around? What was up with that? Well, the Jews had absolutely nothing to do with the Samaritans. In 722 B.C., the ten northern tribes of Israel, if you look at your history, there were 12 tribes of Israel, and they separated 
after Solomon's son Rehoboam became king. And so they became their own nation, and then Judea uh, or Judah and, and Benjamin comprised the, the two uh, southern tribes, even though there were a few other tribes that uh, uh, joined with them. But as I said, in 722 BC, uh, the tribes of, northern tribes of Israel, they were carried away into uh, exile by the Assyrians. The peasants and the poor people of the Israelites were left in the land, and um, they were then uh, assimilated, if you will, um, by other uh, conquered peoples that had been uh, put in, in the land. And so they became a, a mixed race of Gentile and Israelite people, along with a composite religion of pagan beliefs and the Mosaic rituals. And so they, they had these different uh, uh, beliefs that they incorporated along with the Mosaic law. And consequently, Jewish people had nothing to do with the Samaritans. They did not want to travel through Samaritan territory and defile themselves. But the passage reads that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. That it was necessary to go through this uh, part of the, the country. And why would that have been? It was because it was part of a d divine plan. It was ordained by God. There was a woman who lived there who was chosen by God for salvation. We read in verse 5, So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar. Sychar is probably the modern village of Ascar, which is situated on the slope of Mount Ebal. And then we read in the second part of that verse that it was near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. There's a well-established tradition which identifies this well about a half mile south of Ascar. And it's 100 feet deep and uh, it's fed by a running spring. And we read that Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. And th this is a significant point that is made here. Because it points out that Jesus was truly human. He experienced hunger, thirst, sorrow, pain, fatigue. He grew tired. They were on a, a long journey. And he plopped down on the side of that well. And John gives us the uh, approximate time. He says that it was about the sixth hour. Uh, because of his use of Roman time that we read about, for example, in, in uh, John chapter 19, uh, it appears that he was using the, the same method here, which would put the time around 6 p.m. or probably like around late afternoon. By the Jewish reckoning, this would actually put it at noon. But this appears that it was uh, later in the day. And it says that a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And so this is actually uh, interesting here as well because it was customary for the women of that day to travel to a well outside of town early in the morning. Or they would go like later in the evening and they would go collectively. They would go as a group. The women would go together for protection as well as to socialize, right? Talk about their families, catch up on the latest gossip, news about the latest business in town, discuss things that whatever it is that women talk about. But this woman was all by herself. She was obviously an outcast. She was an outcast among Samaritans who were themselves outcasts of the Jews. And as we read on, we see that her life was a tangle of broken marriages and adulteries. She would have been regarded as a trailer park floozy. She would flirt with the guys, but the relationships would never last. They would fold. She was good at attracting men, but not keeping them. She would usually appeal to the wrong guy. Her relationships tended to be shallow, not just with 
men, but with the women. And that's the predicament with this Samaritan woman. She has no friends. The women in town, they don't want her around their husbands. This woman and Nicodemus, they could not be more different. I mean, they were just opposites. And we kind of looked a little bit at Nicodemus and his background last week, but I just want to give you a comparison between these two. Nicodemus was a Jew. This woman was a Samaritan. Obviously, he was a man. She was a woman. He was a devout religious leader. She was an immoral adulteress. He was an educated theologian. She was an ignorant peasant. He was a member of the highest class. She of the lowest class. He was wealthy. She was poor. He recognized Jesus as a teacher from God. She didn't have a clue who he was. He was polite in addressing Jesus as rabbi. She greeted him with suspicion and hostility. He was a member of the social elite in Israel. She was the dregs of even uh, Samaritan society. So they were like polar opposites of one another. And one may think that it makes sense that Jesus would meet up with Nicodemus, right? I mean, here's a religious man. One can see our Lord who was recognized as a, a prophet and a religious leader in his own right, in the minds of many Jews, meeting with a man such as him. But what in the world would he want to do with a loser like her? But God wanted her. God loved this woman, and Jesus reached out to her. He made it a point of changing his usual itinerary to visit with this woman. And she had a far greater impact in her hometown than Nick, Nick, excuse me, Nicodemus had in his circle of friends. And we read in verse 7 that a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And this is where she's introduced. And so the timing of this was just right. And it's interesting as you, how, as you read this how Jesus just had orchestrated all of these comings and goings. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. So Jesus is the one who initiates the conversation by asking her for a drink of water. And this was not a demand, but rather a request. The disciples, they had taken off to go get something to eat. They went to the grocery store. So Jesus was all alone. The woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She was actually shocked that he even spoke to her, let alone asking for something. She had good reason for responding the way that, that she did. Because it was not customary for uh, a man to speak to a woman like this in public. And so she's thinking to herself, who is this guy? Why is he even talking to me? I mean, he's a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. You're a man. I'm a woman. The Jews, they had absolutely nothing to do, as I said earlier, with the Samaritans. They despised Samaritans. And she knew this. The Jews saw Samaritans as, Samaritans as, as worse than dogs. One ancient writer even made a, a comment referring to them as, as uh, the, the stupid people of Shechem. Shechem was one of the towns in Samaria. So not only was she a Samaritan, but she was a woman and was not considered pro proper social etiquette for a man to speak with a woman in public, especially a Jewish woman to a Samaritan, or a Jewish man rather, to a Samaritan woman. Even the disciples later when they returned, if you skip over to verse, 20, uh, verse 27, it says that they marveled that he talked with a woman. So they were wondering, what is going on here? And they didn't even know about her immoral background. They didn't, hadn't even gotten to that point yet. So the Samaritan woman is no doubt um, just thinking to herself, you know, what, what's wrong with this man? 
I mean, you shouldn't even be talking to me. Are you, are you crazy? Leave me alone. But Jesus did not waste any time. He goes straight to the point that he wants to make with her. And it was just like Jesus did in chapter 3 with Nicodemus when he went right to the heart of the matter. And he opens up right away with her witnessing, saying in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. So there are two things that we can see in this particular passage. One is that he offered her the gift of God. Wow, I have a gift for you from God. And we know that that gift from God is salvation. And the other thing was who I am. Jesus was saying, if you knew who was talking to you, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for this living water. And, and this really highlights something that I want you to take note of. At different times, you know, over the years, uh, I can regard, uh, recall conversations with people who would talk about the impact that Jesus had, his legacy and so forth, by saying he had some sort of an aura about him. Something on the order of like a, a halo around his head. No, not at all. He was just a, an average Joe. He looked like just a, a regular guy. We even see this uh, expressed in Isaiah 53. He had no form nor comeliness. There was, there was nothing regal about him, nothing particularly special. This is why Jesus was able to blend in. That's why when she first approached him, she's like, who, who is this person? There was nothing unusual. And he mentions to her this living water. If you knew me, you would ask about the living water. So just as he brought up the new birth to Nicodemus, which was really more of a, a theological uh, matter that he was bringing up with him, on the other hand, with her, it was water. Something that was very basic to life. And that is what he intended for her to grasp. So, so here's an intriguing proposition. Living water. This grabbed her attention. Hmm. This piqued her curiosity. And yes, she does take that literally. But of course, that was Jesus' intention. Because she says in verse 11, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. You don't have a pail. You're not carrying a bucket. And that well is deep. She had to put that uh, bucket down there about 100 feet. So it had to go down a ways. How are you going to get this living water? You know, you, you got nothing to pull the water out of this well with. What, what is this living water? Where are you going to get that? Are you somehow superior to our forefather Jacob? And this is something that uh, she had uh, brought up with him in verse 12. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jacob was one who drank from that well. He's, of course, the, the forefather of the Israelite people. He drank from that. That well provided for his family provided for his sheep and his cattle. This well has a remarkable history. This is a very special well. I guess if you're going to get living waters from someplace, that would be it. But Jesus responds to her in verse 13. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Of course, he was just stating the obvious, right? You drink this water, you're going to get thirsty again. But he, he responds in his gentle way. He gets back to the issue of water again, which is, of course, the source of life. You're going to get thirsty. You've got to keep coming to this well to get more water. But in verse 14, he says, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. 
After you drink the water that I provide, you're never going to get thirsty again. In fact, the water I give you will become like a head spring, a well of water within your very soul, within your being, which leads to life everlasting. Imagine how she reacted to that. Oh, wow. The surprises just keep coming with this guy. First he just speaks to her. Then he tells her about this living water. And now this is water that she can drink that will provide life everlasting. And the more he says, the more startling his message. And so she's hooked. And in verse 15 she says, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to, to, to draw. I, I want this water. i got to have that. I don't want to be thirsty anymore or have to perform this daily chore to come get it. Walking out here, bringing my jar, letting it down into this uh, well about 100 feet, having to fill it up, pull it back up out of there, carry it back home. Remember, there's no plumbing. You know, there's a lot of things in our modern day that we really take for granted. You realize for thousands of years people did not have plumbing? Couldn't just turn on the spigot and get water. There's so many things that we just take for granted today. But, but these women, they would have to go out twice a day, get water out of the well to provide for their needs. It was hard work. She didn't want to have to do that anymore. So again, she's thinking in literal terms, isn't she? I don't want to have to do this. I'm willing to buy what you're selling. But wait. There's a problem that we have to deal with first. Christ was not simply going to grant this woman everlasting life without confronting her sin. And he says to her in verse 16, go call your husband and come here. There are some who believe that there's no requirement for repentance in the Bible that's needed for salvation. In fact, there are those who will cite the Gospel of John, which just speaks of believing on the Lord Jesus. And when we speak of repentance, we're talking about remorse or turning from sin and trusting in, in Christ and uh, coming with a, a heart recognizing that, that we're sinful and we're seeking forgiveness and need to turn from that. And in fact, uh, they will say that repentance just simply is defined as changing one's mind about who Jesus is. But if that was the case here in this particular passage, why would Jesus even bring this up? Why would that even be an issue? All she would have to do is to believe on Jesus who was going to die for her sin, just like he spoke to Nicodemus. Remember when he said, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and then gave the classic John 3.16. The Son of Man would die for the sins of the world, therefore all she have to do is believe in him and be saved. But implicit in calling her out about her immoral life was that she needed to recognize her sinfulness. There was a requirement here to repent. And basically, this would mean that she either break up with the man that she's with or she would have to marry him, one of the two. Because when he said, go call your husband, the woman responded, I don't have a husband. That was kind of a, an incomplete response, wasn't it? The Lord, he filled in the gaps. He said, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the man you're living with right now, he's not your husband. In that you have spoken truly. So there's kind of a measure of sarcasm in Jesus' tone there. And imagine her reaction to that insight, right? This man is just full of surprises. They keep on coming. You know, there must have been a, a pregnant pause as she uh, recovered from the revelation. How could he possibly know that? I mean, he's got to be a, a, a prophet. Someone on the, on the order of, uh, of uh, Elisha. We go back to 2 Kings chapter 6, when he revealed the, the plans of the Syrian 
king and his intention to ambush uh, the king of Israel. He would tell him what he was doing because God revealed that to him. So this has got to be a man uh, who would know all that. Obviously, they didn't have any uh, social media back then, no Instagram or any of, of this. How in the world could our modern teenage girls today survive in this era without having that at their disposal. You don't even see anybody going around without a phone anymore. So she went on to say, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So this prompted a question in her mind, since this man knew all about her. You must be a man from God. And since that's the case, you ought to be able to answer this question for me. And she says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And this mountain that she would have been referring to is Mount Gerizim, where we read about in the Old Testament, um, the ancient Israelites had set up an altar there, and that was the place that, according to Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 11, when Israel had entered the land, they were supposed to pronounce blessings from, um, from that mountain. And so th- this was a, a place that uh, was a, an honored location. And yet J- the Jews say that Jerusalem is where we're supposed to, to worship. But the Lord responds, he answers her question in verse 21, saying, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. The Lord responds with an answer regarding true worship. It's not a place. And in verse 22 he says, You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. The Samaritans' worship of God was corrupted by paganism, And Jesus correctly states that salvation is of the Jews. Even people today have a hard time accepting this, but basically that's a fact. We see from Genesis 49, verse 10, the prophecy regarding the Messiah, where it says that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Shiloh was a reference to the Messiah, who would be not only the king, but also the savior. And then we read also what Paul writes in Romans chapter 9, and in verse 3, where he says, For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ, for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, and he is speaking of the Israelites, as he says, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. In other words, Christ Jesus himself was Jewish. So it's all of Jewish origin. And then he finishes up, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. So Jesus himself was the ultimate Jew. And the fact of the matter is, he's not playing favorites, he's just telling it like it is. Because this is how God ordained it. The Lord specifically created the Jewish people to be glorified through them and to bring salvation to all mankind. And so, Jesus tells her that The hour is coming in verse 23. And now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The time has arrived. And that came with the Lord's uh, appearance. Because he came for that reason. To bring all people unto himself. And as of the day of Pentecost, those who came to Christ would worship the Father in spirit and truth. In spirit in that they would worship from the heart with the right attitude. And in truth, it means worshiping who he is. 
as God has revealed himself according to what he instructs in Scripture. You know, those who say, well, I, I worship God in, in my own way. Well, you don't, because that's not worship. If you truly worship God, you worship him according to his will and not yours. And you worship who he is as he has revealed himself in Scripture, exalting the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Savior of all mankind. I was talking with Wesley yesterday, who was... Uh, uh, bringing up Sedona, and, and I know of some people who have gone there, and there are those who are just overwhelmed by, by the beauty and, and just the nature and all of that, and they just sort of see themselves as being in some sort of a shrine and, and just become all spiritual, but they find themselves worshiping nature and not the God who created all of that. And those who do that are guilty of idolatry. You're worshiping a God or something else that basically you've manufactured, that you've made up. You're not worshiping in truth. And so it is vital that we do that. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, which means that he is not only invisible, but he is everywhere present, which is why you can worship God wherever you are. And it's vital for us to understand that. And so the woman then said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. Even as these words were coming out of his mouth, her thoughts turned to the one who was proclaimed and prophesied to be the Savior, that one who would be the ultimate prophet. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. The Samaritans accepted the first five books of Moses as being from God and authoritative. And so they too believed in the coming Messiah, the one who would be the Savior and the ruler. The Lord God even prophesied in Deuteronomy 18 and verse 18 that he would raise up a prophet just like Moses. And that would be the Christ who would come. And she says, when he comes, he will tell us all things. So just as the Lord Jesus was revealing these insights and giving these revelations about herself and about what real worship entailed, she realized that when the Messiah comes, he's supposed to do just what this man is doing. He will tell us all things that we need to know. No more uncertainty. No more ambivalence. Everything will be crystal clear. When he comes, he's going to set everything straight. So even her as a Samaritan had this same hope that the Jews had, waiting for the Messiah to return, waiting for him to come. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Wow, imagine her shock at that. Right? It's just one thing after another with this man. So what he said was, was really the ultimate surprise. Remember what he said at the beginning of their conversation. If you knew who was asking you for water. And then he drops this bombshell. I'm the Messiah. She was both shocked and overcome with joy. You're him. You're here. You've arrived. As we skip over to verse 28, she just leaves her water pot. She just forgot about getting water. She just leaves her jug right there by the well. And she just all of a sudden takes off just as fast as she can go. She wants to head back. This is fantastic news. The Messiah is, is here. I mean, this is better than discovering a, a cache of gold. And she heads back to the village just as fast as she can go. And then we read in verse 29, her exclamation to everyone, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. He knew everything about me. And no doubt she revealed some details that he had told her so that they would all realize that uh, this was the real deal. He, he told her things that there was just no other way that, uh, that he could have known unless he was himself God. 
And she says, could this be the Christ? In other words, is this the Messiah? Has he finally come? And she believed that it must be him. And when they heard her story and they saw her exuberance, remember, she didn't have many friends in this town, but most of them knew her. So either she had just lost her mind or there must be something to this that's worth checking out. And it says in verse 30, they went out of the city and they came to him. And so they did. They checked it out for themselves. And as we move on ahead to verse 39, it says that many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word, because of the, word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. I mean, she was convincing in what she related to them, the details about her life that no one outside of her or her immediate circle of, of acquaintances would have known, would have been familiar with. And here was this outsider, a Jewish man no less, who knows all this information about her. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there again for, for two more days. They were enthralled with this man. They came to the same conclusion, that he was, in fact, the Messiah. And we read in verse 41, and many more believed because of his own word. In other words, they, they were enamored with what he had to say, and they were able to find things out for themselves. And then they told the woman, now we believe. Not because of what you said, for we heard ourselves, or for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. As as they heard his message, as they spent the next two days with him, they were able to discover that he was, in fact, the Savior. And these Samaritans received salvation. Samaritans received salvation. Jesus went out of his way to a small town of despised people to reach out to a poor woman who was herself despised by her own townspeople to preach the gospel. And this woman who was treated as a nobody became his greatest witness. She was responsible for the salvation of her villagers. By contrast, Nicodemus, he never did anything. Later, we know that he defends the Lord and he puts himself in jeopardy by taking Jesus' body along with Joseph of Arimathea after Christ had died. Jesus' approach with Nicodemus was more theological and intellectual as he discussed with him the new birth. But the woman that he witnessed to, his message was more practical using a basic need of life, which was water. Something that is vital for our very existence in order to convey the the drinking water that supplies everlasting life. And later in John chapter 6, Jesus did the same thing with bread. One exuberantly received the gospel. The other did not. One realized that she was a sinner. The other, he had a hard time accepting that. He was a very religious man. The man who was well-educated and knew so much, he understood little. But this woman who knew next to nothing theologically and was seen as a nobody whose life was a waste, she received salvation. She received that with absolute joy and she became one of the first evangelists recorded in the Gospels. Who says salvation isn't a miracle? The Samaritan woman is proof of God's saving power and grace and the eternal value of one lonely and lost lamb. May we all stand at this time for the closing benediction. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy 
To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And the people said, Amen. Amen.